Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Welcome back to our series, Glimpses of Greatness. And this week, we're going to be having the opportunity of learning a little bit more about Rav David Feinstein, Zechet Tzadik Livrocha, as we spend some time with Rav Tzvi Ram, which is a very fantastic opportunity for all of us. Um, I'd like to first off by, uh, start off by thanking our sponsors, um, to Nachman and Toby Lokshin, who are sponsoring the entire series. Lili Nishmas, Toby's, the Yorta of Toby's father, Mr. Um, Abraham Flesher, Avram Eliezer ben Yehuda Leib Olav Shalom. Also today, we have the opportunity of thanking our sponsors for this particular se session um, upon some very special occasions. We thank Baruch and Esther Weinstein, who are sponsoring today's session for the 32nd Yorzeit of Baruch's mother, Mrs. Gladys Weinstein Gittel Bas Zanvil Dov, whose Yorzeit will be this evening. Um, as a Shem, she should continue to get Nachas from the family as it grows, expands, and brings more Kedush Hashem into the, into the world. We're also going to be thanking Moish and Michelle Boydek and David Kramer on the who are sponsoring for the yard site of their father, Mr. Simo Kramer Simcha Zev Ben Chaim. Simcha Zev Dov Chaim Ben Svi David, um, whose yard site is this week as well. A man who always brought a smile to our shul and to wherever he went. And Mr. Shem Shev continued alias Neshama. And every time his memory his name is mentioned should be Livracha as a blessing. We also thank um, Michael and Karen Rosenblum who are sponsoring. This is the, the around the time of Michael's mother's yardside, Mrs. Harriet Rosenblum, Henya Chemda, Bas Shmuel Alea Shalom. And also today happens to be the Pidjan Abeno, their first grandson, Yehuda Yeshai Judah Franco Raffel, who's going to be Nifte um, this, uh, this evening, Bashar Tavim Mutzlachas on a beautiful mitzvah. Mitzvah Shem, he should continue to bring Kedush into the world and fill. Um, the shoes, the, the lofty shoes are the names that he carries as well. And also we thank Yitzhak and Barbara Siegel, who, was, um, um, and, um, uh, who, was, who are sponsoring for Barbara's mother's yard site, Mrs. Sarah, um, Sarah, Sarah Ann Lehman, um, uh, whose yard site is this week, Sarah Bas Yitzhak, Mishulam Faivish, Chana um, Edel, Vachaya Chana Edel, um, Alea Shalom, uh, Bezra Hashem, she too should look down and get continued nachas from all the incredible work community work and beyond that you are both involved with um thank you so much everybody for joining and let's 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 get let's get down to uh, to business it is a great opportunity that we have today with us rabbi tzvi ram um for those who do not know rabbi ram yet rabbi ram is the rov of the bialastaka shul down on the lower east side he's also teaches Gomorrah, he teaches in the ibc program in yeshiva university so when i was working that opportunity of getting to see Rabbi Ram in practice as well, and he's also the administrator of the Manhattan based in for Gairus for conversions, and I have the, the incredible zechus, the merit of working alongside or watching him when he works on that based in on a um, almost monthly basis as we get to see some of the, some of the most incredible human beings who, who are joining Klal Yisrael. And so Rabbi Ram, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. Thank you, Rabbi Trump. Uh, it's really a, always a pleasure working with you with the uh, the Besden for Conversions, which we've uh, been involved with in recent times. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you this morning and to join uh, virtually with the youngest Earl of Lawrence Cedarhurst community. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It really, it really is incredible. It's been, for those who have not been watching, Rabbi Ram has given a number of shirim and I've written an article in the Lair House about Rav, 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 Rav David Feinstein, and I think that for some of us, I know I can see some of the, the guests, so some of the, the folks who are, who are watching in today really had a relationship um, with them. I can see Mr. Questel is over here, who's, uh, who's, who's with us today, um, who really had a relationship for a lot of us. Unfortunately, we didn't necessarily have that relationship, but we're looking to really learn a little, a little more to gain an appreciation. Um, would it be possible just to give us a general sort of sense of the biography, just sort of a, a general uh, biography of, of, of Rav David, just for, to give us a framework? Sure. Uh, first of all, I, something I can recommend, which uh, I myself was very moved by just watching about a week ago, uh, the Yeshiva, Masivta Teferth Jerusalem, MTJ, which of course was Rav David's Yeshiva and Rav Moshe's Yeshiva, Rav Moshe Feinstein's Yeshiva before Rav David, uh, put out a beautiful hour long, I think maybe more, long, more than an hour long tribute to Rav David's life, uh, which is available online 
and uh, among the, uh, the many, many beautiful aspects of the, uh, the presentation, it also goes through a little bit of the early biography. You know, Reb David passed away at the age of 91. He was born in 1929. So um, most of us don't remember back that far. Um, so it goes through a little bit of his early history, which is really very fascinating. And even those of us who know him personally may not have known the, the original history. Um, Reb David Zatzal was born in Luban. Uh, which was in communist uh, Russia. His father of Moshe Zatzal uh, heroically served as one of the Rabbonim under the communists and somehow managed to keep Yiddishkeit going as best as possible under those circumstances. Um, the, the official communist policy was that religion was not prohibited, but you were not allowed to teach religion to children. In other words, you can practice, the old people can practice religion, you know, they, uh, they can have a synagogue, uh, they can have a rabbi, they can do all of their, their silly, uh, you know, antiquated uh, practices, but to teach the next generation, that's, that's turning their minds against the truths of communism, and you're not allowed to teach the children. So Reb David, although he was born in a rabbinic home, was not allowed to be taught, there were no chadarim. And uh, even his father was not allowed to teach him. And the communist secret police were certainly of a caliber that uh, Rav Moshe did not want to risk life and limb to, uh, to teach his child. So the story goes, as again related on this uh, beautiful video, that Rav Moshe would sit and learn out loud and Rav David would be in the room. Rav David was not quote unquote being taught but he would sit and listen to his father learning out loud and apparently as a young boy memorized Tanakh by virtue of just sitting in the room while his father Rav Moshe was learning out loud and quote unquote teaching him in that indirect fashion. Um, apparent, again, they were late on this video that uh, they used to test, you know, the older people in Luban used to test Rav David's knowledge um, of Tsukim and Tanakh, and they would give him, uh, you know, some Russian money, you know, when he would get a Pasuk right, then he actually accumulated a decent amount of money as a small child, uh, you know, in communist Russia, by virtue of his knowing Tsukim, which again, he wasn't allowed to learn. Um, when the fat when Reb David was about seven or eight, the family moved briefly to Latvia, where he was enrolled in a cheder for a brief period of time. They were, apparent, they were not under the communists, he was allowed to, uh, to learn in a formal sense. Then they then relocated to America. There was a brief period of time where Rav Moshe was uh, checking out other rabbinic positions before he ultimately took the position on the Lower East Side, Mr. Tiferes Yushalayim. Once he took that position in uh, an MTJ, so Rav David was transferred into the yeshiva again as a young boy, I think eight, nine, something like that. And basically, on, on a certain level, the rest of Reb David's biography is incredibly simple. For the rest of his life, he was affiliated with MTJ, um, you know, as an elementary school child, as a high school boy, as someone who matriculated in the base medrash. Really, as his uh, as his Rebbetz, Rebbetz and Malka said in the video, uh, he never left his father's Dalit Amos. He, he was constantly in the presence of his father. And one of the things we'll talk about today is just part of the greatness of Reb David, not all of the greatness, but part of the greatness of Reb David is that he was really the Talmud Muvak of his father, the outstanding student of his father and the repository of his father's uh, halachic decisions, his piskei halacha. But basically he just stayed in the Lower East Side, stayed in MTJ, did not move out of the neighborhood, did not leave the yeshiva. Um, he eventually even during his father's lifetime, became a Rebbe in the yeshiva. And I know many of the Balabatim, I know some of the older people on the Lower East Side remember fondly how they were in Reb David Shir. Um, one person who literally, after he heard the news of Reb David's passing, broke into tears, literally broke into tears. A man in his 70s, I would say, um, you know, said to me, I remember when he was just Reb David, and then we had to adjust to calling him the Rosh Yeshiva after Reb Moshe's passing. And, you know, the love that he felt and that so many felt for Reb David Zetzal was just something that was very beautiful and meaningful to watch. Um, he was involved in the yeshiva through the time that Rav Moshe Zetzal uh, was Rosh Yeshiva. When Rav Moshe passed away in 1986, uh, he took over the helm as the, as the head of the yeshiva. And, you know, much of the, 
of the impact of Rib David goes beyond the yeshiva itself, because even during his father's lifetime, um, he was known as a very, very big Talmud Chacham and someone who um, was involved in paskening Shilas. Again, not overstepping into what was, what was his father's territory, but was involved in helping his father uh, to a certain extent with some Shilas. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but particularly after his father's passing, he really came into his own as someone who was renowned as a posek, someone who was renowned as a Baal Eitzah, somebody who uh, people sought out for his advice, for his direction, um, and, uh, you know, really served in that capacity up until his death. He was incredibly, incredibly active till very shortly before his passing. Wow. Wow. Thank you. That, that really puts things in perspective. Was he the in the line of the of the of Rav Moshe's children? Wh what number was he in the in the age order? So he he was the third out of the four surviving children. I think Rav Moshe had a son who died very young, um, but basically uh, the the oldest was Rebetzin Shiskal. Allah Hashalom was married to uh, of uh, Eliyahu Moshe Shiskal was a Rosh Hashivan Tarav Adas. Uh, Rebetzin Shifra Ten Sifra Tendler. Uh, was married to Yibadol Chaim and Moshe David Tendler in YU, then Reb David, then there was a gap. And uh, when they came to America, uh, Reb Ruven, Yibadol Chaim, the Rosh Hashiva and Yeshiva Staten Island uh, was born. I see. So let's, let's move to more personal. And when was the first time you heard of you got, you got the chance to meet, to meet Reb David? So I, I, I can't remember the first time I heard of Rib David because it certainly goes back. I mean, again, as, as those of us, uh, yourself, myself, the Talmudim of Yeshiva University, um, I, I don't think we had personal contact with Rib David as part of the YU experience, but, but his name was certainly a name that was well known in the Bismedrish, uh, you know, during the time that we were there. Um, as is well known, uh, the Feinsteins and the Soloveitchiks are actually related to one another, and there was a very warm relationship between the Rav Zatzal and uh, Rav Moshe Zatzal, and that carried over, you know, into the relationship with uh, with Rav David, Rav Ruven, you know, the and, and the succeeding Feinsteins. I must say, you know, even though uh, occasionally one hears of differences of opinion between the Yeshiva University world and the quote unquote Yeshiva Welt. Uh, that was not something that I ever heard from any of the Feinsteins, uh, Reb David, Reb Ruven, any of the children. There was tremendous, tremendous respect for the uh, the learning that went on in Yeshiva University and tremendous respect, certainly, for the person of the Rav Zatzal. Um, so I can't I can't pinpoint the first time that I ever heard about Reb David, uh, but I'd heard, I had heard Psakim from Reb David even as a Talmud in, in Yeshiva. Uh, the first time I met Reb David was actually 19 years ago, exactly this coming Motzei Shabbos. Um, Shabbos Vayakel Pekude HaChodesh in 2002 was my Proba Shabbos at Bialystoker Synagogue. It was my tryout Shabbos. I guess I passed. They, they offered me the job. Um, and, you know, I was told that, you know, part of the Proba informally was that uh, Motzei Shabbos, after all of the presentations in the shul uh, were going to be done, so my wife and I would be accompanied by one of Reb David's Gaboyim up to his apartment and, and meet with him. Um, again, from my perspective, I saw it as an opportunity, probably from the community's perspective, they saw it as an extension of the Prabha, you know, let's see, uh, you know, let's see if he passes muster with Reb David. Um, so, you know, we came up Motzei Shabbos, the Gabay brought us to the apartment, uh, rang the doorbell, and uh, the door opens up, and it's Reb David himself in his shirt sleeves, you know, no tie, no jacket, very informal. Shalom Aleichem, nice to meet you. You come in. Uh, we sat down at the table, Reb David, Tibot Luchayim, Ms. Rebetzin, Rebetzin Malka, my, my wife and myself, the Gabbai, and we just really schmoozed for a period of time. Reb David was not the biggest schmoozer. He tended to be a quiet person, but he was friendly. And, you know, he, he would always make people that he interacted with feel very comfortable. And uh, the truth is, I, I walked away from that Shabbos thinking, you know, I may or may not get the position, but at the very least, I had an opportunity to sit and schmooze for half an hour with uh, one of the uh, Gedola Yisrael, with an uh, outstanding rabbinic personality. Um, so that was the first time. 
And then, you know, once coming to the neighborhood, the interaction was fairly frequent. Um, those who know the Lower East Side know that even though we're located in Manhattan, we're essentially a shtetl. It's a, it's a couple of blocks long and everybody knows one another. Um, everybody interacts with one another. I mean, uh, they're about, again, pre-COVID, I would say there were about 15 different minyanim that would take place on a Shabbos morning for a community that has, you know, maybe, maybe 250 Shomer Shabbos families. Um, if anyone, again, pre-COVID would make a kiddush in, in, a, in their shtibol, so most of the neighborhood would come over to wish mazel tov or to say hello or whatever it happens to be because there was just this feeling that, you know, we're all one big family. We just happen to be spread out among uh, different places. So, you know, in that kind of environment, people would very often ask me, you know, do you have anything to do with Reb David? It was almost a silly question. We all have what to do with one another. So, of course, you know, certainly the Rabbanim had what to do with Reb David, uh, you know, during the course of the many years, uh, you know, asking him Shiloh, seeking eight cells. Um, community issues certainly would be brought to Reb David for his, uh, for his impromptu. Um, you know, and he was very much a presence in the neighborhood. He did not lock himself in his apartment. He was a person who was out in the streets. He would do shopping in the local supermarkets. Um, you know, again, as, as, as many people have mentioned, he used to eat breakfast in the local pizza shop for years and years and years, uh, basically until the pizza shop closed. Um, you know, that was his regular, you know, part of his schedule on a typical morning. He davened, you know, when he was well enough to walk easily, easily, he would walk the couple of blocks to the pizza shop, have breakfast there, walk back to the yeshiva. And he was incredibly accessible in, uh, in that kind of way. Incredible. Incredible. So, so humble. So, so, uh, so with the people, that's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, his humility was something that was commented on. And it, again, I, I, I don't see into anyone's heart, but one got the sense that the humility was incredibly genuine. It wasn't a, it wasn't a put on, you know, he wasn't, you know, sometimes people in their arrogance, in their arrogance, try to project an image of being humble. You, you didn't get that impression at all. You, you, you know, he was a person who was, uh, I know of Aaron Khan, uh, was Maspid Reb David said, you know, the, the, the underlying aspect of his life was that he was just an Eved Hashem. You know, he was a servant of Hashem. What does Hashem want from me in this circumstance? It could be to give a shear. It could be to pass at an end of life, Shaila. It could be the, to fill the soda machine as he did for so many years in the yeshiva. I remember when, when the last couple of years they built Reb David a somewhat more rabbinic looking office in the yeshiva, but for many, many years, certainly I remember when coming to the Lower East Side uh, almost 19 years ago, um, his office was at the end of the hall and the office doubled as a storage room for old Sfarim, um, soda cans to restock the soda machine. And in the midst of what looked like kind of like a warehouse, you know, Reb David had a little table and a little chair in the corner and that was his office. And he was perfectly fine with that. You know, he, he didn't need a, a, mahogany, a mahogany desk or anything like that. You know, he liked things very, very simple. Unbelievable. Actually, it reminds me that, that um, Rabbi Kiva Eger says that the mask that Moshe Rabbeinu, the veil Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu wore was to veil his humility. Because in order to be that leader, he needed to actually hide the humility from the extra ink that was came from the little, little, little Aleph in the Vayikra. So in a certain sense, but he never... He never lost that, I meaning when he came to Hashem, he took off the veil. So right. the core was, there's so many arrogant people who want to pretend to be humble. Moshe Rabbeinu was a really essentially humble person who had to pretend to be a strong leader from time to time, but out of his basic personality was humility. Um, like you were saying, so this is a, a beautiful, beautiful description. You know, I think that not so many people realize just the scope of the types of Shilas and the scope of the types of decisions that were passed across the desk of Rav David. I mean, so many levels you mentioned life and death, so many different things. Can you just give us a, 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 a sense of some of the some of the the shalas you're privy to, or you you got a sense of that really were were that were under his jurisdiction, under his uh, the guidance. Sure. Um, so first of all, with Pesach coming up, something that I think many people don't realize is that the almost ubiquitous shiurim for matzah, maror, dalid kosos, you know. Uh, almost every Pesach guide, you know, they print 
those pages that uh, show you, you know, like uh, how many inches of matzah you have to have in order to, to make a kazayas, those shiurim were developed by Reb David. They, they're, they're, they're presented as, quote unquote, Rav Moshe's shiurim, but the one who sort of did the research and then presented it to Reb Moshe for his stamp of approval was Reb David. And I, I've heard from people, again, who were a little bit older and remember in the yeshiva, they remember Reb David going to the science lab in MTJ. You know, they had a full science lab as part of their, their high school. They would go to the science lab at MTJ and take beakers and, you know, start measuring liquids in order to, you know, get a full sense of what a revius would be, you know, for the purposes of Dalit Kosos or the like. Um, and, he, you know, he did experimentation with all of the shiurim, the way they're presented in Chazal to try to translate that into modern day terms. Um, so, you know, anytime you know, a person uses those shiurim, you're feeling the impact of Reb David, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, I, I'm not privy to the full scale of uh, Shailas and Shuvos, you know, so I actually, I spoke to one of his gaboim uh, over Shabbos, um, you know, who did ha does have a better sense of what the Shailas were that were actually coming in. Um, so he said overwhelmingly, and again, this is my sense anecdotally, overwhelmingly, people would bring end-of-life Shilas to Reb David in the last years. Again, I, I know just from my own experience, you know, he, he was one of the addresses in the United States for anything having to do with end-of-life decisions. Um, I remember having a, a relative myself who uh, called me up, you know, a person did not live in the Lower East Side and said, you know, I, I, I have a relative who's in an end-of-life situation. I, I need a psak. Do you happen to have like Reb David's secret phone or something like that to be able to, to get to him directly? Um, but, but he passed in many, many of those of those Shilas. Um, I know also from Talmidim, he had many Talmidim over the years who became Rabbonim in different communities, uh, some who became Rabbonim in communities where there, where there were many Kiruv type Shilas. Um, and uh, I know many of those Rabbonim who would call Reb David throughout the time that they were out, so to speak, of the hinterlands, you know, dealing with the kinds of shilas that, uh, you know, come up in those in those types of situations. People went to him, personal status issues, you know, is the person Jewish? Is the person not Jewish? Is the person a Kohen? Is the person not a Kohen? Uh, things of that nature. Um, I know even recently, uh, the major Kashrus organizations uh, would consult with Reb David on kashrus issues. I know recently with, uh, you know, cloning uh, cells of, uh, of animals, you know, let's say if you clone uh, pig cells, you, you make a pig out of, uh, out of cloned material, you know, what's that status in terms of kashrus? That was a question that was asked to Reb David. Um, he, you know, over the years, and again, his career in Psak spanned decades, um, probably anything under the book, you know, was really brought to him in that uh, in that kind of regard. Um, I mentioned it in the Lehas article that uh, that you mentioned, and uh, again, others have certainly mentioned it as well. Um, Revel Yoshev Zetzal consistently would tell people in America that Reb David was the address, you know, for for Psak Halacha. So you know, when 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 you're when you're at that point in the pyramid, you know, ultimately every kind of every kind of Shiloh goes to you. Having said that, I think it's also important to emphasize that that he was not he he was not uh, shy to answer what we might call yalavyovo type shilas. Meaning, one of the things that was really incredible about Reb David was that he had this national and international prominence, but he never stopped viewing himself as a child of the Lower East Side, as, as sort of a, a neighborhood personality, a neighborhood Tamil Chacham, um, that manifested itself in many ways, but it also manifested itself in, you know, the Stam person on the street feeling comfortable to go over to Reb David and ask him a Shiloh, which the person may have thought was, you know, a, an earth shattering question. But uh, in point of fact, really, they could have looked it up in the Kitzvah Shulchan Aruch. And Reb David, you know, did his fair share of responding to those types of shilas as well. And, you know, th there was never a point at which he would say anything along the lines of, you know, like, why don't you look this up on the Ezra's Torah, Luach? You know, why are you bother me with this, this kind of shiloh? 
Kakoton Kagodo Tishmon, you know, he was he was a person who was ready to pass in the biggest Shilas, but was also ready to pass in the, the, the small Shilas as well. That was an integral part of his personality. Incredible. It comes back to sort of that humility as well, that just yeah. whatever whatever it is without it be, without there being a judgment on the person. He had this incredible connection to people of the Lower East Side. And uh, I, I think it's relevant to mention, you know, even in the context of a, of a presentation for people in the five towns who are not from the Lower East Side, um, you know, it's, it's reminiscent of the statement, all politics is local, that ultimately, you know, as, as big, you know, as the politics may be, at some point, everything goes back to the local, to the local, you know, neighborhood, you know, to what's going on in a local, in a local setting. So I think for Rabdavid as well, Rabdavid, you know, never lost sight of the fact that with all of the influence that he had, and people would come from all over to ask him, Shilas, Sundays especially, people would line up in the yeshiva, you know, from many other places to, to ask Shilas, to ask for brachos, to ask for eitzos, you know, they, they would want to interact with him. Um, but but he, he never lost sight of the fact that he was rooted in a particular neighborhood. And I think that's a, an important lesson for all of us. You know, you have to be connected to the, the concentric circles that are around you, that are closest to you. Never lose sight of your family, never lose sight of your neighbors, never lose sight of the people who are close to you in a geographic sense, you know, and that's, that, that's, that's, that's important no matter how great you are and how great an influence you have. You know, that local aspect of things is very, very important. Um, when he would travel during the summer, just like a little thing, which uh, a parent, you know, told me, he would travel during the summer sometimes, you know, he, he did not take many vacations. I mean, even during the summer, he was mostly at home in the Lower East Side. Um, but when he would travel occasionally, he'd take a little bit of time here and there, he'd go upstate sometimes during the summer. Um, if he had the chance, he would go around the camps where various Lower East Side kids were were there for the summer and he would just visit his boys you know he'd stop in at the camps and oh there's a low recider here you know uh, let's let's go say hello now again if you've ever been in a camp and they bring a rabbinic personality to the camp you know it's always like a big uh, a, a big to do you know at sadik bolo ear you know that sort of thing you know the, the you know this rosh yeshiva is coming that rosh yeshiva is coming this big rub is coming he would just stop in in the camp, you know, oh, is, um, you know, Chaim Yankel uh, Goldberg, you know, over here, I just want to say hello, you know, he's, uh, I, I know he's in the camp for the summer. So that that kind of, you know, simplicity uh, was part of the way that he would uh, function as well. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We, we, uh, you know, I think that another aspect uh, that Rav David, um, that people are not aware of, is you know like even if you open up a regular stone edition of the Chumash and you go to the back of every parsha, yeah, David was the one who 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 wrote the the Devar Torah about the numer the mnemonics about the number of circular right. parsha. I was just wondering from your perspective, was there a, a Devar Torah a, a a idea a thought that 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 particularly resonated with you, or that something was that was Shagur B'Fiv that he used to say a lot of the time? I'll share a psak which. Uh... I heard this at the Shiva actually from his sons. And uh, I, I think it's uh, the Psak itself. It's an interesting Psak. It's also a very illustrative Psak, I think, in some ways. Um, so Rav Moshe, go, we'll go back to Rav Moshe again. Rav David was such a repository of the Psak and Rav Moshe. Rav Moshe has a tshuva where he talks about a certain, he was asked about a certain shita of Rav Yaakov Emden. Yaakov Emden, of course, was the, one of the great Torah authorities in the 1700s. Rav Yaakov Emden had the following had the following psak. Yaakov Emden said that when you're learning a blat gemara and you come across the shem Hashem, you can say the shem Hashem as we would say it in davening. You don't have to say Hashem. You could say Adokai. You know, you could pronounce the shemos as as we would normally pronounce them in davening, and that's true even for the brachos and the tefilos, which are mentioned in Shas. So in other words, if you encounter a, uh, you know, a line in the Gemara where it says, Baruch atah Hashem alakinu ma'alacholam sh'akoni yabid varo, you can recite the bracha with, with the regular shemos as if you were about to drink a cup of water. And Rav Moshe, the tshuva, basically says, yeah, we don't really follow that, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to take, you know, the name of God in what's potentially in vain in that kind of context. And that's what he writes in the tshuva. Apparently, 
not in the tshuva, you know, apparently orally, Rav Moshe held that if there was a need, one could rely on that psak of Rav Yaakov Emden. So you say, what kind of need? You know, the guy's learning Gemara and he just, you know, he feels this uncontrollable urge. He has to say the Shem Hashem. Like what, what kind of need exactly would come up? So, so Rav Moshe said, look, sometimes there are times where a person is not sure whether a bracha should be recited or not. Um, you know, generally speaking, there's a principle, Suffolk bracha slahakel. If you're not sure, don't say the bracha. But under certain circumstances, it, it might be permissible to recite the bracha with the shame, but to do so in a context where you're learning. So in other words, if, you know, if the Gemara were to introduce a certain bracha, you know, uh, by saying, you know, when you drink, say, Baruch HaTolashem, so you could learn the Gemara and then say the bracha as part of that, and then that would enable you to say the bracha in a kind of backhanded, you know, uh, unusual kind of way. So that's the preface to this story. So apparently Reb David very much held of using this Reb Yaakov and in B'Sha'as Adchak, and here was an example of B'Sha'as Adchak. Again, I heard this at the Shiva from the, from the sons. So a fellow was making a Pityan Aben. I know you mentioned uh, that one of the sponsors today, the, there's a Pityan Aben in the family. We wish everybody a Mazel Tov, Shavlad and Achas. So a fellow was making a Pityan Aben. And uh, as it happens occasionally, the fellow miscalculated and they planned the Pityan Haben for a day before the actual day when the Pityan Haben would have been relevant. You know, they planned the Pityan Haben for a day early. And as you know, one could well imagine this kind of situation, they only sort of realized that the Pityan Haben was a day early as it got very, very close to the actual day and it would have been very difficult and embarrassing to cancel, right? You know, it's uh, two days before, a day before, and all of a sudden, you know, they look at the calendar and it's, oh, uh, you know, uh, we kind of messed this up over here. So they went to Reb David. Reb David said, it's not a problem. So go, ho- go ahead with the Pityan Haben. All the brachas you say at the Pityan Haben, recite them in the context of the Gemaras that quote those brachas. And so for the average person attending the Pityan Haben, it will look like it's a regular Pityan Haben. All of the brachas are going to be recited. You know, they'll just be introduced with a couple of extra words. Tanu Rabbanon, the rabbis taught, okay, you know, maybe they'll figure, okay, maybe that's like a Galatiana Minog or something like that. And uh, and they'll go ahead with the Pityan Haben and everything's going to be wonderful. Everything's going to be great. And then quietly the next day, call back in the Kohen, bring in the baby, do the actual Pityan Haben. But, you know, at least this way you can save face in that kind of fashion. And I, I think it's, a, first of all, it's a very interesting psaac you know, the, that you could go ahead and just say all of these brachos, which under normal circumstances would be a bracha levatala, a vain bracha, you know, because everything's being done a day before the right time. But also what profound sensitivity, you know, a person, a, a rav could have just told the person, you know, okay, you kind of really messed this up, swallow your pride, send out the email, you know, the un and uh, just tell everybody it's going to be the following day and, uh, and deal with it, you know. Uh, Reb David was in incredibly, incredibly sensitive to people's feelings. And even if it meant relying on a, uh, a psaac, which his father had written in, in, uh, in the Igris Moshe, was not such an accepted psaac. But, you know, if we need to rely on that in order to preserve a person's dignity, to preserve a person's uh, feelings, you know, so that's, uh, that's something very, very important and we should definitely do so. I, I think there's just such... Uh, you know, such sensitivity in that psaac. And, and again, I'm sure there are many other psaacim of that nature. You know, you pull out all the stops when it comes to trying to protect uh, somebody's dignity, somebody's honor, and to save somebody from embarrassment. A very, very beautiful idea. Sure. So that's all the that convergence of that sensitivity and psaac at the same time. Right. Just incredible. Well, 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 when you mentioned so his relationship to his father, you know, Rav Moshe was prolific. He wrote... He wrote and he wrote and he wrote and he responded and he responded and the Igros Moshe. There's still being there's still there's still material which hasn't been even even published uh, of, of Rav Moshe. Yet Rav David didn't seem to to take the same halach of those written psakim and publishing. And how did he view himself in, in relationship to to his father? It's sort of the the Yitzhak after the Avraham, perhaps the how did that right. right. So the article I wrote in the Lear House, I actually gave my perspective on that, which uh, again. Do with it what you may, you know, is it, uh, it's not, uh, not Rav David's perspective, it's my own perspective. But I, I think 
Reb David, as part of his humility, also had this incredible democratic ethos. You know, he really believed that Torah should be made as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Um, and I think one of the things that, again, people uh, do not uh, do not appreciate as much as they should is the incredible role that uh, Reb David Zetzal played in the art scroll movement. Um, you know, again, if you look through the art scroll, the Svarim, you know, his name is listed as a uh, trustee of the uh, Masara Heritage Foundation. Okay, you know, I, I don't really read that that page, you know. Um, you know, yes, at the end of every parsha, his, his very insightful, um, you know, notes on the mnemonics that are used to summarize the number of sukkim in the, in the parsha are mentioned. Okay, fine. But the truth is, Reb David was really a major role in the whole project of art school. Uh, Rabbi Meir Zlatowitz, uh, Zechrona Levracha, was a Talmud in MTJ. Um, and that's, you know, really, it was somebody who looked to Rav Moshe and to Rav David for guidance. It was a beautiful story that, uh, again, I mentioned that Lairhouse article was written up by uh, Rabbi Yisrael Besser in Mishpacha magazine. I think he wrote it also in the biography of uh, Rabbi Meir Zlatowitz, that uh, in the early days of Art Scroll, Art Scroll was very, very behind on money. And they were having a hard time. They, they thought the whole enterprise was going to collapse. So when Rabdavid got wind of it, he, he basically took his life savings and he loaned it to Rabbi Zlatowitz. And he said, look, here, you know, so I, I have this money, you know, you'll give it back to me eventually. But for right now, do it, uh, use it to, to serve the cloud, to serve to serve art school. And he valued the, the, the work of art school tremendously. I mean, again, it's not just that he wrote a Haskama. He handed over his life savings and said, you know, use this to help further art scroll. So anytime you pick up an art scroll safer of any sort, Reb David was behind it, not just spiritually, but in a material sense, was really a, a major supporter of art scroll as well. He believed that Torah should be accessible to people. And I think that that manifests itself in, you know, his sheer style, the shiurim, tended to be very simple and straightforward. He read the Gemara, he read Rashi, he read Tosus, you know, he gave a Mishnah Brewer Shir on, on Sunday mornings. Um, you know, the, the Shiurim were very shat and text oriented. Now again, you know, so you give an, an interesting interpretation of something, but but again, very, very pshat. They were not what you might call a razzle-dazzle kind of shear where you walk away, wow, that was brilliant, you know? Let's focus on learning the text and just trying to understand it. And whatever he did right tended to be very popular in nature also. His svarim are English svarim. The svarim that they put out through Art Scroll, you know, are English language. Um, I, I know one of the Balabatim that you said was, was close to Reb David once told me that if you took one of Reb David's Svarim with Gematrias, he liked Gematrias very much. If you were to write it up in Hebrew and and print it and leave the author's name out, he said people would think it's one of the Rishonim, you know, who's writing these Gematrias, but he put it out in English. Why? Because I think he felt he wanted to make Torah as accessible as possible. He wanted to make himself as accessible as possible. He wanted to make Torah as accessible as possible. And that that was, I think, a sort of democratic ethos, you know, that uh, that motivated him to a very large extent. Having said that, you know, when we talk about the differences between himself and Rav Moshe, it's also important to talk about the similarities between himself and Rav Moshe. The humility, you know, Rav Moshe was renowned. It was said about Moshe Rabbeinu, but it could have been said about Rav Moshe Feinstein as well. Uh, you know, this tremendous humility and respect for everybody and a readiness to interact with everybody, you know, no heirs or the like. And again, the psakim of his father were, were things that he knew firsthand. I, I know I mentioned this in one of the hespedim that I gave in our work with the Besden. So our posik is uh, Rav Heshel Shechter Shlita, certainly has a connection to the uh, the Five Towns community. Uh, there were two occasions where Rav Shechter said, please go and ask this Shaila and Geirus to Reb David. And his feeling was that Reb David would be able to accurately convey Reb Moshe's position, you know, because he had been so close to Reb Moshe that, you know, asking Reb David was the equivalent of basically getting the Masara straight, you know, from, from, uh, from Reb Moshe Feinstein with regard, you know, to any issue that one was to ask. Um, even so, there were certain things that Reb Moshe did 
that Rib David, that were perhaps idiosyncratic, that Rib David would follow what everybody else did. Uh, they say for many years by the Starim, also talking about Pesach, Rav Moshe had certain hanhagas, had certain practices that were based on the Vilna Gaon. Um, so, so like the Vilna Gaon, Rav Moshe would use two matzahs by the Seder. I guess it's cheaper that way, right? Now, so, you know, Vilna Gaon held that you didn't need Lecha Mishnah on the, on the night of the, of the Seder, right? So you break one of the matzahs. Yes, you don't have Lecha Mishnah, but the din of Lecha Mishnah is waived on the night of the Seder. The, 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 the males at the Feinstein Seder would each have their own set of matzahs. Rabbi David would use three. I, I with Moshe. Okay, but you know, the Minan Ka'olam, the, the standard practice is to use three. So again, there were a few things like that where, you know, um, you know, Rabbi Moshe would have a certain position which was, which was idiosyncratic and, you know, Rabbi David would, would be aware of his father's position, certainly, but, you know, would, would defend his father's position, but in practice might follow the Mishnah Brura or, you know, some more, you know, generally accepted uh, approach in, in, in that regard. I, I'm teaching now in the shul every Friday night, there's a Dvar Halacha between uh, Kabbalah Shabbos and Mayriv. We're learning from a beautiful sefer, uh, the Dibar Tobam, which was put out by Reb David uh, Reb Baruch Maskowitz, um, Shlita, who was a close chavusa for Reb David for many, many years and put out Svarim detailing uh, some of the psakim of Reb David. And it's interesting to note how, you know, there are times where Reb David will veer from his father's psak, you know, will acknowledge his father's psak, will certainly say if a person wants to rely on his father's psak, he certainly can. But if the Mishnah Brura holds a little bit differently, he'll, 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 he'll recommend that the average person follow the Mishnah Brura. You know, so, uh, but again, he was a tremendous, tremendous repository of his father's psakim. Well, so that, uh, just to take that further for a second, I, I remember once hearing that Rav Soloveitchik used to comment, and as you mentioned before, Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Moshe had a very close relationship um, and fam fam familial relationship, and I, that the Rav used to comment that he was called the Rav and Rav Moshe was, was called the Rosh Hashiv when it should have been the other way around when um, when when he was really the Rav Soloveitch was more Rosh Hashiv and Rav Moshe was a more of a poisek, but I, I heard that that um, that Rav Moshe himself, you know what what he favored was his Dibrois Moshe more than the Igros Moshe. Even his 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 writings on the Gemara, his shir that he gave in the Yeshiva as the, as the Rosh Hashiva more than even the the Psakim. Where did where did where did Rav David stand in that in that spectrum? Was he did he view himself more as the Rosh Hashiva as the poisek in between? Where was his 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 call? That's interesting. I, I think what was said about Rav Moshe really does apply very much to Reb David, meaning the title that everybody used in referring to Reb David, certainly in the neighborhood, but beyond the neighborhood, was the Rosh Hashiva. You know, in the Lower East Side, you spoke about the Rosh Hashiva. Uh, that that's who you meant. You know, you were talking about Reb David. Um, having said that, in, in many ways, his his personality was, or his his focus, I guess, his professional focus in some ways was more that of a rav, um, meaning he, he was pasketing shilas locally, he was pasketing shilas globally. And, you know, there was also an element of, uh, you know, local leadership that he took. I mean, certainly all the local rabbanim, you know, would look to him. There was never a formal hierarchy or anything like that, but informally, you know, it was understood that there was a hierarchy and if there was any kind of community issue, it ultimately would be brought to him, uh, you know, for his input and his uh, his weighing in. Um, I remember in my early days, there was one, unfortunately, there were many such times that uh, they were firing rockets from the Gaza Strip into Eretz Yisrael. You know, there's so many times, unfortunately, I don't remember which particular one it was, but it was, uh, you know, uh, communities around the world were saying to Hillam. And uh, Reb David felt that it would be important for the whole community to gather together and uh, and say to Hillam together, have words of chizuk. So uh, physically, I have the largest shul in the neighborhood. So he said, we should make it in Bialystok shul. All the Rabbanim should come together, get their Balabatim to come, come and say to Hillam. And uh, Reb David got up and he addressed the, the assembled, which was unusual. He was not a speaker. He would give shiurim, but uh, spoke in public very, very rarely. And his focus was, you know, what kind of kavana can we have in our tefillos to address the situation? 
what kinds of things can we take upon ourselves, you know, spiritually to address the situation. You know, he, he played that role of communal leader, um, you know, when he felt that it was necessary and when he felt that, you know, his, his words would have a maximal impact. Um, and, and again, you know, I think he really did see himself in that Rav, who, you know, if, if we can talk about the Rav having a, a Rav, meaning having a, an impact on the people as opposed to being in a kind of ivory tower, Rosh Hashiva, you know, set up. Uh, so he very much viewed himself as a person of the people and a person who related to the people in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. This is this has been really incredible, um, Rabbi Ram. What would you say, you know, for us, us folks, you know, as regular folks, what 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 is that we could take away? What's some what lesson that we could take into our own lives from Rabbi David to be just somewhat closer to the, the type of world that he envisions? Right. So, one of the things that comes to mind is what those of us who say Yit and the Shabbos say about Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Whenever you find his greatness, talking about Hashem, you find his humility as well. Greatness and humility are not contradictory. They actually, the humility enhances the greatness. I think that's a very important lesson for Rav David. I'm struck in this period of time how Rav David was really able to relate to people across the Orthodox spectrum. Um, you know, unfortunately, I know you and I were talking about this in a different context. This past year, besides all of the difficult things associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the many, many distressing and terrible things is just how much of our rabbinic leadership has passed away in this past year. Again, some from COVID, some not from COVID, but, you know, just the sheer, the names, it's almost like a whole generation, you know, in the course of a year was really taken away from us. Um, so what's interesting is that, you know, among those great leaders who were taken away from us, some of them operated within, you know, what we'll call the modern Orthodox world, you know, Yeshiva University, uh, you know, the Dati Lumi community in Eretz Yisrael. Um, some of them operated in the more Haredi world. And I've seen different groups talk about the loss of great rabbinic leadership. Um, the Haredi groups tend to talk about the loss of great Haredi leadership. The modern Orthodox Dati Lumi groups tend to talk about the loss of great modern Orthodox Dati Lumi leadership. But one thing that both lists have in common is both lists tend to list Rabbi David Feinstein on the on the you know the roster of great rabbinic leaders who were lost. You know they may not list other Haredi leaders, or the Haredi leaders may not list other you know modern Orthodox leaders. But somehow Reb David, like his father, like his father in so many ways, was a person, you know, who people in the OU and the Yeshiva University world would feel comfortable approaching, sat on the Moetzes. There were many people learning in the Yeshiva who were from the Hasidic world and Hasidim, Hasid, Satmer Hasidim, who in Hasid, Satmer Hasidim, if you know, had their issues with Rav Moshe Feinstein on certain issues. But with Reb David, they would come to Reb David for brachas. You know, and you know the 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 rare example of someone who was so respected in the Hasidic world, in the Yeshivish world, in the modern Orthodox world, someone who was sought after and seen as a bridge in that kind of way is just a tremendous, tremendous loss for Klal Yisrael. It's not it's not someone who's easy to replace. You know, on that on that level. Of, of halachic leadership, who's you know so acknowledged across the uh, the spectrum, um, I guess if you know if we were to try to emulate that in our own lives, it's to realize that you know there's more that unites us as as a people than 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 that which divides us. Um, I told the, I, I I think I mentioned this in the the hesped I gave through YU. Um, I remember there was a few years ago in the neighborhood, they wanted to make a fundraiser for Karnei Shomron, a, uh, one of the Yishuvim in the Shomron. So Reb David came to the fundraiser, and at the end of the fundraiser, he wrote out a check, you know, and it wasn't an anonymous check. It said, you know, David Feinstein at the top. He gave him the check. Somebody counted to me, you know, what other, you know, what other Rosh Hashiva who was not part of the Mizrahi world, you know, but you know, we have no problem. Okay, we're supporting Yish Yishuv and Yehudav Shomron. Great, you know, here's a check. Uh, you know, without any fanfare, it wasn't, uh, you know. 
but that 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 you know the labels didn't matter so much to him. You know, he was a person who just saw Jews, and uh, you know something very very powerful and very profound about that that I think we can certainly all look to emulate. Very much so. Very much, Ram. Thank you so much. This has been very elevating, and I hope for all of us educational. And it's a shame of the opportunity to learn more, to learn more of Rav David's Torah, and to also ultimately become just a little bit more like him, like the world that he pretty envisioned. I, I, I want to take you, an opportunity to thank you for taking, making the time early on the Sunday morning. Thank everybody else for, for joining us. It should be a Hashem, a Shavua Tov, Hashem, a wonderful week ahead. I mean, thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you for all the participants for joining.